Uh, welcome. Thank you. My name is Melissa, and thanks for having us here in New Mexico. So um, Scott's going to do the majority of the presentation, just mostly because of the time frame, and then we'll just both answer questions. But just wanted to say a couple of things. Is one, we're most excited that you're having us here because you're actually interested in finding out what the Duluth model actually is. Thank you. We, we applaud you for that. And I say that sort of half fun, half you know facetiously, uh, in part because. As the director at, in Duluth, um, I've been doing this work for 16 years and you know, been a part of Duluth for, for a long time. And so right now where my work is at, I spend half my time defending it and half my time taking away from people who are stealing it. And so it's equally being stolen by people who are selling it, making money off of it, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very interesting thing to be a part of this work um, uh, in, in terms of the Duluth model. So. Uh, we're going to have Scott talk, um, but just know that our work, and as a woman who experienced violence myself, I just have to tell you the one thing that I would say about, you know, no matter what you choose or pick, is that um, I, just, I just feel really strongly about this idea that it has to be based in the lives of those who experience the violence. And that if we're not hearing from them, if we're not hearing from their experience, that it's, it's just, um, it's hard for me, honestly, just to wrap my mind around because that's the thing about intimate partner relationships, right? They're intimate. And so if we, only, if we don't ever hear from those who are victimized, um, our approach, we're just missing so much of the mark. And so uh, whatever you choose, you know, we're just here to talk about us and answer your questions. And so thank you for your time. And then I'll just say a few words at the end, okay? Thanks. This is Scott. He's our blueprint coordinator. And I'm the boss. And so, you know, we like to practice controlling behavior in Duluth. So I'm controlling him and telling him he has to talk most of the time. Yeah, right. no. I had Baxter during part two, so I have to sit down. So, anyway. Okay, so I'm the guy who didn't get the memo that no ties were in the room. So <laughs> I was in Rhode Island training Navy and, uh, and Marine prosecutors on Friday, flew back, had Saturday off, and then flew here on Sunday. So I didn't unpack. So this is my Navy Marine Corps training outfit that I, <laughs> um, that I was wearing. So um, yeah, we're gonna, I've got a lot of slides. I'm gonna try and get through them uh, quickly in the front end. It, it, the goal is obviously to create some time at the end to ask questions and give you a little bit of an overview uh, of what the Duluth model is, what the coordinating community response is and how the men's program fits within that um, coordinating community response. So the Duluth model is not an outcome. Okay? It's not a police policy. It's not a men's program. It, it doesn't dictate any particular outcome. What it does is it gives you an approach to how to organize something that both prioritizes victims' safety and holds offenders, offenders accountable. It could be used in a hospital system. It could be used in a criminal justice system in Russia that doesn't have probation um, and doesn't have half of what we have as far as agencies go. Um, it could be used to organize a men's program. It could be used to organize an entire criminal justice system or a particular police policy. So it's really an approach to organizing as opposed to any particular outcome. Um, it has shared assumptions. We, we understand, and going back to what Jeffrey was saying earlier, if, if, if the judges believe this is a problem of relationship and advocates believe and police believe it's, an, it's a problem with the individual who's using the violence, the outcomes aren't going to match. And the, and the offender, as they go through the system, is going to hear different messages from different folks. If everybody understands domestic violence the same way, you're much more likely to have a consistent response, regardless of who it comes in contact with that offender or victim. And then we want to empirically test this stuff. And we do it two ways. We have a domestic abuse inter, uh, information network that we designed to track almost every step of the criminal justice system. So if you came to Duluth and you said to us, not that we'd exactly tell you, but we could, <laughs> just because some of the information we've got to keep close to chest. Um, if you wanted to know what one of our judges average bail amount for misdemeanor domestic assaults for Native American men, we could tell you. We could tell you, the, uh, you know, over the 200 officers that we have in Duluth, what each officer's percent to asking the risk questions to victims are um, uh, on every case, every outcome. And we've been collecting this since the late 90s. So we've got this big database full of thousands of, 
of, of, of men who, who've battered um, and how those, those outcomes have either um, uh, showed us that we're doing something that we, we, sh we should continue or we need to change it or we need to let it go because it's not working the way we hoped it would. Um, so that's one way. The other way is to talk to women who are um, experiencing this particular violence. I'll give you a quick example. Um, we have domestic abuse no contact orders in Minnesota now. It's a, it's a, it's a criminal no contact order that can be issued at uh, arraignment. So um, if they violate it, it's actually a crime. It's not a violation of probation. Um, women were not included in that discussion. Um, a lot of women who are battered didn't want that. Um, none of them were told that they, it, you, can, you can make put conditions on them as opposed to have um, you know, the order or not the order. Um, so we developed a card with all of our expertise at DEIP, a draft, that we thought that would explain this to a woman at the scene that we give them to. And then we brought two focus groups of women together and gave it to them and said, would this help you? Would this work? And they said, well, first off, it's two pages. We're not going to read both sides. And we said, but, but it's really good information. <laughs> you know, I really think you might want And they said, no, really. you got to understand, at that moment, if the officer says to me, circles it and says, this is something that will happen tomorrow, you should probably read it, we probably will. But if it make it too long and you make it about all your kind of language, then we're not going to, it's going to be just more court speak and we're just going to ignore it. So they rewrote it the way that they would they, they understood the information, but they rewrote it to the way they thought a woman who was battered in that moment would stick to it. And then that became, and they completely changed it. Completely changed it, you know? That's what you get when you include the people you're trying to serve in the process of the organizing. Um, and so that's the other way that we test things. Um, and then well-defined methods of interagency cooperation. In Duluth, each criminal justice agency has it part of their criminal justice policy in domestic violence that they will meet with multidisciplinary agencies to review their practice and how their practice both the outcomes that they have and the outcomes they're having on other agencies. So if the, do the police, does the police report the way it's being written help the prosecutor? In what ways does it? In what ways does it not? They're required to meet with each other, with us. We coordinate those. Um, to continue to move this work forward um, so that it doesn't become stagnant and stale in one particular place. That's just an idea. That's an approach to how do we organize a system. So when you look at this, the Duluth model is the approach. The coordinated community response is what we've produced with that approach in Duluth. Okay? Now, when people come to us and ask for training, they might come to us and say, we want a prosecution training, or we want a probation training, or we want a police training. Or we want a training on how to work with men who batter. Or we want a training that, that teaches us how to do this whole thing. We want to take on the whole, we want to create a whole coordinated response across our criminal justice system from 911 all the way to the men's program. So people pick and choose pieces of this based on where they're at, where they're going to start, um, and then we give that to them. As Melissa said earlier, though, folks go to a community, they get one of these pieces, and then they test it <laughs> through some sort of evaluation or research project and say the Duluth model doesn't work because it didn't work the way that they wanted to in that community. When in fact, they didn't actually test the Duluth model at all. What they tested is one of the, one of the outcomes to our coordinated community response. That's what they were actually testing. And they didn't have all the components that we have together in that research. They were testing one aspect of it. And typically, that's the men's nonviolence program. Um, so a guide to organize. I'm going to say more about advocacy in a minute. Um, victim experience in, in integral in and in integral in designing um, uh, both our curriculum that we use with men who batter. That started with conversations with women about what they believe we should be talking to women to men about in these groups. What's important to you that we talk to them about? That's our main curriculum. When we developed our Christian nonviolence supplement to that curriculum, again, we sat down with women, mostly even the evangelical faith traditions, and asked them, you know, what's it like to be you being beaten by a man who's part of that faith tradition in your home? And they talked about the churches. They talked about the collusion of the pastor. They talked about all these things that we didn't have any idea about. We had no idea what the curriculum was going to look like yet because we're just in conversation about what's your experience first. Then, what should we be talking to these men about? 
What are the tactics, the ways in which they get their way in your home? And then we design a curriculum from that. Then we go back to them and say, did we get it right? Is this accurate? Are we reflecting your experience or not? We create videos from their experience. We hire actors, script writers. We put them together. We bring them back to the group full of women. And we play them and say, is this your experience? Um, and if they, if, if great, if it is, if it's not, then we either change it or we get rid of it. They have to be linked to the next work of the agency. So in a coordinated response under this Duluth model idea, what 911 does has to make it better for what law enforcement is going to be asked to do when they get to the scene. And what law enforcement does has to be made better, uh, has to be done in a way that makes it better for the prosecutor to do what they're going to do. And for the judge to make decisions and for the probation officer to do their charge, whether it's pretrial release or, or uh, a pre-sentence investigation at the, at the tail end. And then it has to also help the men's nonviolence program at the end, right? Um, so each of these agencies have to be linked. So this whole idea of siloing is what we're always up against, right? Um, I go into a community and they say, you know, there was a time in our community when we investigated, you know, crime, but we don't do that anymore. <laughs> and then I go to the law enforcement agency and they say, you know, there was a time when we actually prosecuted crime in this situation, but we don't do that anymore. And they just, they, 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 from their own silo, point fingers, and they don't ever fix anything because they're staying in their silo. Our job as the advocacy agency is to go in there and figure out what those gaps are and find ways to link them together. Um, and then we don't ever focus on the worker because you all have those, right? I mean, you all got that cop, that men's program, that, you know, uh, prosecutor that just like, are, they, are you kidding me? Are they really going to say or do that, right? We all have that, but that's not the focus of the change, right? Because if you could do that, then all, the, the only real intervention you have is training. You know, and it only lasts as long as that person's in their job. Our focus are the issues systemic. When the probation officer walks into the courtroom and gives a 10-minute PSI and never mentions what this man did to the woman that got him arrested, that's a problem. But when we ask the question, so why do you say that in the courtroom? Because it's what's on my form. I'm answering the questions on my form. Ah, okay, so if we're gonna change what you say, then we gotta change the form that's directing what you say, right? It's not the worker that's the issue. What creates the circumstances that give that worker the direction that they have? That's what we wanna focus our change work on. And then it keeps you from that finger pointing, judgmental kind of stuff that goes on in a lot of CCRs. Um, we got to balance the victim safety with offender ac accountability and improve the work experience of the practitioner. So I can't go to a cop, you know, if you're a law enforcement officer and I say, I got this great idea, Patricia. It's going to cost you about 10% more time, but I really want you to adopt this. What I'm going to get is, mm, yeah, probably not. It's not going to happen, right? So I got to have a way of listening to what victims are saying the problem is with the way that law enforcement is responding. And then going back to law enforcement and collaboratively in partnership, figuring out what's the solution that's not going to, that's going to make your job actually better. And better might be that you actually spend more time, but we have to have a way of proving that the time you're spending is going to be more productive than the time you're spending now. Quick example, place out in uh, California. Officers are spending five, eight minutes to, at the scene doing a probable cause. Boom, they're done. Really short report, okay? They're saying, I don't have time to do a report like you're doing in Duluth. There's just no time for that. But when we looked at the dismissal rate of cases and added up all those eight minutes over and over and over, hey, you're just blowing your time. You have to write a report. You have to go to the scene. Do you want that time to mean something, right? That's the question. So that's how we try and figure out how to make your job better and make it safer and more accountable for offenders. All right. Okay, so in Duluth, to, um, to your question earlier about how central should an a advocacy agency be in this, to, to our model, it's essential. Um, when we go into a community that has a coordinated response and the criminal justice system is the one leading the charge, we end up seeing gaps in 
um, safety for victims and uh, offender accountability. Uh, and we also see advocates where there's 12 criminal justice folks around the table and there's an advocate. And that's the voice in the room then for the people you're trying to make the community better for. When all these other folks have a different way of engaging that problem, she's the one who's gonna be the most directly connected to the problem and how it plays out at home. And, and you've got one of those voices in the room. So what, a, what, what institutions tend to do when they organize is organize in a way that makes it better for them before they make it better for the people who they're trying to serve. And what we're trying to do is create an environment where we get advocates in the room who are organized to make it better for the women that they're trying to serve so that that CCR doesn't lose its way um, and just make things better for themselves. Judges um, in a community, when they went to mandatory arrest, their calendars got full. They got jammed up. So the judges ran the CCR. They wanted to change the outcome, clean up the calendar. So they created a deferral program for first time offenders. But what you had to do at arraignment is plead not guilty. And most women who are arrested plead guilty at arraignment because they got kids at home and they got to get back to them, right? They have all these different ways, you know, and plus, yeah, I did it. Do you know what he does to me? It's a different way of thinking about the violence that they've committed. The guys, on the other hand, virtually never plead guilty at arraignment. So the only ones that ended up in that response able to get the deferral program were the men who were battering the women and the women ended up being the ones convicted. That's because they didn't have advocates involved in that organizing who could have saw that coming from a mile away, right? All right. Um, so another thing about the model is that we have a set of principles that we work every intervention from. So in Duluth, whether you're looking at the men's program, a police policy or a probation response, they all have to be consistent with these um, policies, uh, these principles. Not every principle applies to every single intervention, but any intervention cannot be in conflict with any of these principles. So this guides our conversation. If it's off this, then it's off the model, okay? Um, and again, we're talking about the coordination effort of the system. And I'm not gonna, if you wanna get a detailed explanation of each one of these, go to the Praxis International website um, under Blueprint for Safety, and they have a, a detailed explanation of what each of these mean um, for the community. Okay, shared understanding. There's three types of violence. Domestic violence is the crime, but not everybody who commits an act of domestic violence is a batterer. Women's movement organized around battering. Not about Billy who hit Johnny because he took his motorcycle today. That's not an ongoing threat problem, all right? The woman who finds out that her husband um, cheated on her and slaps him across the face, committed a crime. But that doesn't pose the ongoing threat of the one who's beating her on an ongoing basis to, uh, to uh, get her to submit to whatever it is that he wants. So if we have a way of distinguishing what cases are battering, what cases, cases are resist of violence, so the woman is being beat but she uses illegal violence as a resistance, that doesn't mean she doesn't get arrested if it's illegal. But at the point of prosecution, what does justice look like? Does it look the same for the guy who's beating her into submission, right? We have to have a way for prosecutors to understand that nuance. Um, and then non-battering violence, which is everything else um, outside, of, uh, outside of a battering relationship. So we have a, you know, if you, if you look in um, your handouts, uh, not right now, if you don't, well, I can't control you, you can do whatever you want, but, um, <laughs> On page 51, uh, and we'll talk about more about what these are in a minute, but these are the risk question, example of a redacted police report from Duluth and a victim's answers to risk questions, which give us a clear indication um, in this particular case that we're dealing with a batterer, not somebody who's using situational violence. The power of the state should be restricted to controlling the illegal act of the offender. So because a woman got beat, doesn't mean the state gets to walk in and start telling her what to do. It's an essential component of the model. Um, understand that victims are rarely free to cooperate because we're accounting for the power difference created when he beats her. So in a, in a police response, the officer walks in, one officer takes her to a room, and he interviews the offender here, and the other officer 
interviews her in another room because you're not going to get the best evidence if she's standing right next to him because she's not going to tell you what she's going to tell you if, he's, if she's out of earshot. We know that from practice over and over and over again, right? Because there's a power imbalance that he's created between the two of them with his battering. In men's programs, how do we account for this, right? We don't send guys home with relationship skills to go try out with their partner because A, they're probably going to fail and it's not going to be their fault, it's going to be hers, right? So if, if this guy's thing is about money and we're sending him home and we're, we're practicing in the room and let's say he takes everything to heart and he says the exact same words we teach him, right, um, to go say to her about money, who's he talking to? This is a woman who's experienced rape, beat, multiple times, humiliation in front of her children. And he's going to come home and, hey, I want to bring up money. I mean, the red flags for her are going to be all over if that's where the violence has been coming from. And so when she takes the checkbook and says, fuck you, and throws it at him and walks out, and he comes back to the men's group and says, eh, see, there's the deal. You know, I'm, I'm kind of living with a crazy person. I'm doing the right thing, right? We haven't accounted for her. Because it's not in a relationship problem. It's not a skill deficit. It's his thinking about the entitlement that he has to go into that home and make her do what he wants to do. That's what we have to focus on, right? So the women told us, please, don't send him home with skills to try out on me or my kids because it doesn't work, right? And so we listened. We stopped. Um, account for power. Uh, and the better is responsible for stopping their violence. It's their... It's their issue. It's not a relationship problem. Okay, so we move to the coordinated response. It's an interagency effort, and we're trying to change the climate of tolerance. So we could take the time and go around in each of your communities, and you could say, what are the things that happen in your community that tell men who batter that it's okay to do this? And we all got them, right? We all have those things. Um, and we're trying to create an, a response that challenges that. So when men come into the men's program, and say, well, you know, I got convicted because I live in Minnesota. Okay, that's telling me that we're changing the climate of tolerance, <laughs> right, for this stuff in the community. Um, and then we institutionalize the practice and the procedures. <clears throat> Rather than just training folks, because that just is a, is a hole you'll never fill, we go in and we say, okay, we want to change the way that the policy reads that you're going to respond to this. And then we're going to follow that to make sure that, that all your officers are doing that and then give you feedback that that's what's happening. If you institutionalize it, it has a sustainability that training absolutely does not. It evapor the training stuff evaporates. So in Duluth, there isn't a single officer now, including the chief of police, who ever was an officer without the du a Duluth model police policy. It's all they've ever known. It's what they work with, right? That's, that's the sustainability. Our, our first police policy was instituted in 1982, right? That's longevity, right? <laughs> more, than, more than the training we did in 1982, I can tell you that. All right, well, I'm not going to go through these again. These are on uh, Praxis's website. You can go to that too. But this is the level of detail our organizing um, has, our, how sophisticated it's become. Ellen did this in her um, PhD dissertation talking about how institutions are organized to move workers along from these different sectors. And typically the problem and any response and the solution can be found in one of these pieces, okay? So to give you a quick example, an administrative practice. So in Duluth, we need risk information. And the best information you're gonna get from a victim is at the scene of the crime. So we needed them to ask questions at the scene that would help us assess risk. And all officers are required to ask every victim of intimate partner uh, domestic assault these five questions. And again, if you go back to that uh, redacted police report, you can see what an example of, of the kinds of uh, answers we get. And then ask yourself, if you're a men's program or you're a police officer is that, or a prosecutor, is that going to help you understand um, who you're dealing with and, and at what level and what risk that person poses to, to their partner. These are some of the bullets um, of, of things we get from just those questions that are asked. Okay, I talked about this. All right, so the first 
um, uh, research piece, I don't know if it, it was a study. I don't know how much it's been lost to history. We have the outcomes, but we don't have the actual paper anymore. Um, it was done in 1983, and it was on, um, it was on uh, mandatory arrest. And no community had ever, ever had mandatory arrest before. State legislatures had allowed for it, but no police department at that point had ever made it policy. And so what we did is we took a third of the officers and said, you're going to have this um, a mandatory arrest policy. And the other officers were going to do what they were mostly doing up to that point, which was uh, mediating, um, asking people to uh, walk, take a walk around the block, sleep someplace else, that kind of thing. And the other group of third of officers got the choice to do the, which, either one. Um, and what we found was, and what the chief found, was that in mandatory arrest cases, the evidence was what, much better. The men who were arrested recidivated less than the men who were asked to walk around the block. In fact, they had the, by far the highest um, recidivism rate. Um, and white men ended up getting arrested at a much higher rate than they were prior to mandatory arrest. So the officer could make the dis had the discretion to make arrests. They were arresting mostly Native and African American men. And when the mandatory arrest policy came in, the arrest of whites went way up. So that's what we learned the first um, time we did any um, evaluation of Duluth. And then um, Melanie Shepard, uh, Dr. Melanie Shepard from uh, University of Minnesota, did a, um, the first five-year recidivism study um, in the U.S. in Duluth. And our, uh, out of the 100 guys, 40% reoffended. Um, this is at a time when jail was rarely used in these cases for a consequence. And our men's program actually had 11 therapy sessions that they had to go to. And when they finished that, then they had to go to 11 community education um, classes. Now, everybody, you know, one, you know, this is at a time when, again, too, that when we had these guys in class, and I wasn't, you know, at this time I was uh, just graduating from high school. But, <laughs> so it wasn't me. But when I'm talking to the people who did this, at that time, when the men came in a group, they were saying to them, okay, you beat her. Okay, you need to have some accountability for that. And the guys were resisting. I mean, this was the idea. We're going to tell them who they are, right? So this, this, this thing that's followed us forever about how Duluth is shaming um, happened in the early 1980s. Nobody remembers that there were 11 therapy sessions, but they all remember the shaming piece for some reason. That one stuck with us. Um, and what we realize is that doesn't work. And the 11 counseling sessions didn't work either. In fact, the therapists are the ones that said, we want to give this up. We'd rather use your curriculum with these guys because it gives us some guidance. Um, plus, these guys really don't want to be with us. And it's nice when you're doing therapy if they actually want it. Um, so they thought that the curriculum uh, actually worked better. So the, the evolution of our whole response is, is dramatic. Um, another formal research published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence on the coordinated community response um, showed uh, a reduction of recidivism when men went through the whole coordinated effort so that there was this cumulative effect of arrest, prosecution, probation supervision with intensive uh, sanctions. Those kind of things um, all had an impact on their recidivism. And these all get published, right? These are in journals. Nobody ever wants to refer to them, though. I mean, you never see them cited. What you see is a Broward County, Florida study um, on a, who are using some of our work. That's what gets attached to us. But then they say there's no research that says Duluth works. Yet it's published, it's out there, it has been for many years, um, but it's rarely cited. Um, and the Wisconsin, Washington State uh, piece that I'm sure you've all uh, seen, they, that wouldn't have counted in their study because we took uh, volunteers. And they excluded any research that had volunteers. They had to be all court ordered. So it says that there's, this, is the, this is how much Duluth has been researched, but they didn't even mention that there is research out there that you could look up that didn't fit our study. They don't, I mean, so then it begins, to, it feels a little political then, as opposed to transparent um, the way research I think should be. All right, so how do we do this going on in a more cost-effective way? 
Um, we, I told you we have the day in this database. And what we've done twice now is taken two years worth of men. One time there were 353, one time there were 326. And we looked at their overall recidivism the first time uh, and the second time, but we added one component that we didn't the first time. We were looking at what the, the overall system's impact was. So when a guy goes, gets arrested, goes through that whole process and goes to the men's program but may not complete it. So that 29% is completers, non-completers um, together. And re-offense was defined as arrest, non-arrests, which means in our, in our police policy, when an officer goes to the scene um, and it's a domestic, but there's no probable cause for an arrest. Okay, that means she called before he did anything violent or he did something, but she's not gonna say at that point. The officers are still required to write an incident report. The only time they can, they're, they're not required to write an incident report is if they go to the scene, say a neighbor called, thinks there's a domestic, they get there and it turns out to be a non-domestic, it's a verbal difference over something and somebody just got scared next door, then they don't have to write one. But if it is a domestic or there's an allegation that somebody was hit, then they have to write an incident report. That counted in our um, piece as recidivism, okay? Um, also, a granted order for protection, not just a violation of an order, but when a woman went in and got a judge to grant her order, that was, a, that was recidivism to us. And then we followed them from the eight years from their last class. So, Eight years from that last class out, we checked for any of those factors. And what we ended up with was 29% for the years of 98 to 99. And then we did it again, uh, 04 to 05. 34% overall recidivism, 29% for the men who completed, and 41 for those who did not. So we ended up with about a 12% bump. And if you can necessarily say it's all men's program because there's so many different factors to take in. But um, for men who completed, completed the class, it was about 29%. When you add the two together, um, about seven out of 10 guys don't show back up in the civil or criminal system eight years from their last class. Yes? How many classes? 27. And, it's the, and, and actually the judges are the ones that asked for this. Going back to that conversation we were having earlier about money, they were saying, okay, so we're doing all, we got all these policies, we're doing all this stuff. Is this having a financial impact? And, you know, we didn't have an answer. And so we put this together with a, a based on a Massachusetts study that was done, um, these factors, and uh, this is what it came out as. So the judges were basically, if, if we could do this with DWIs, if I could say that seven out of 10 DWI offenders, we would never see again, eight years from the last point. That would be success, so. I mean, you can decide whether that's good for you or not, but this is what it is in Duluth. And this is just all the participants. This isn't just uh, a selection. This is everybody who was arrested and ordered. Yes? I have a question, what do you think, um, so I've heard we've been saying that a lot in Mexico, that you can't just, in an isolated way, look at the DIP and the criteria right. and the program, but it's something that needs to be looked at. So when you think about according to your response team, at first it almost sounds like, okay, so everybody has to be like, Law enforcement. Law enforcement, hands down. Law, law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, there's just no, the uh, most arrest studies show an impact on recidivism. Not all, but some, most. The other thing is that everything else we do to manage him, see so here's one of the fascinating things to me, is that I'll go to a community and they'll make the men's program put all the, uh, put all the effort on the, on the risk analysis. The guy got arrested a year ago. What have you been doing for the last year? If that guy was that dangerous, wouldn't you want to know that at arraignment to fashion what the pretrial release conditions are going to be, right? So we're doing the risk analysis from the police reports the morning after, before arraignment, so the judges, prosecutors, and probation all have that information and craft pretrial release conditions based on that. And then the men's program gets that at the end and can build on it, but that should be done in the front, and you can't do it without law enforcement. They are the cornerstone. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, the men's nonviolence program. Just buzzing through the coordinated community response here. Um, so it's a component of the coordinated community response. It's not any more important than the police response, the prosecutor's response, the men's program. They're all a piece, equal piece of that puzzle. Um, we have a formal relationship with advocacy programs. We run an education program. There are no HIPAA regulations that dictate us. So there are things that the advocacy program gets from us um, and has access to about these offenders. They know that when they come in, they sign those documents, that, they, they, that we will share their information and their participation. Not what they say in class, but their participation and their status with us. And any threats that they make to themselves or others will be also shared with the advocate immediately, as with law enforcement. Um, probation, received bi probation receives bi-weekly reports from us on attendance record, their status. Um, uh, we're in daily communication with them about the men in the program. We run about 250 guys through the program a year uh, in Duluth. We meet all the same uh, Duluth model principles, and we provide classes for quartered men, women, and support and education groups for, for women. So we want to create an experience that's liberating, not dominating. This has been, for probably the last 20 years, what we've been training people to do when they're doing this curriculum. And there's a, um, you know, this, this, again, you know, this notion of shaming. If you actually watched our men's programs, you'd see this is not, or gone to a training, you'd see that this is not part of what we do. We understand that the criminal justice system has this capacity to impose accountability on these guys. That's what they're organized to do, and they can do it well, okay? But when the guys come into the men's program, we need to create an, a, a space where they can find their own accountability for what they've done. That's a different way of thinking about accountability, right? But they don't stay in that process without a strong criminal justice response. Otherwise, they just, they just quit. Um, engage in dialogue versus counsel and advise. Um, so if you, if you came to a class and we were on a tactic of abuse, like emotional abuse, we'd say, um, so what are the ways in which you emotionally abuse your partner? What do you do? Call her names. What names? Cunt, whore, bitch. What else do you do? I make her showing her cell phone at the end of every day. And then I start questioning her about who she's talked to. What else do you do? Don't let her see her family. Punish her by taking the baby, weaning her off of it. You know, doing those kind of things, right? So when you do those things, what's the intent? What do you want to have happen? I want her to shut the fuck up. I want her to do this. I want her to stop doing that, right? They list all their intents. What's the belief that says that when your partner ignores you, for example, you get to be violent to her because nobody gets to ignore me. Really? Nobody? Do the police get to ignore you? Yeah. Does your boss? Yeah. Who doesn't? She doesn't get to ignore me. Okay? And then what's the effect of what you've done to her on her? And they list this up. It's typically a shorter list. What's the effect on you? When you do this to her, get arrested, lose my family, sleep on the couch, don't get to come home, that kind of stuff. What do your kids learn when they watch you do this to, the mom, to their mother? Right? And so at the end of the night, it's not our lecture about what emotional abuse is. The board is all of their words. This is their reality. And it's never the same ever. Been doing class for 15 years. There's never been the same class on emotional abuse because the men are different in every class. They bring their own stuff. And then you ask them, look at the board. Is this, is this the life you want to lead? Damn, I didn't, I didn't think that when I call her a bitch that all this other stuff is connected. Right? And it's not our thinking. It's theirs. They put it together as a group. Right? The other so, piece, just to end about that, say just because it's, it gets brought up a lot about that it's all about the power and control, it's not. The other half of our work is about equality and about relationships that are based in respect. 
And so um, many, you know, there, there is a prior version of the curriculum where we just did that. And then it was, you know, women were saying, men were saying, you're telling me this is what I do, but I need to know what else to do. And so that's a big shift in our work that lots of people don't talk about is the equality work. So we're not just the power control, we actually have two wheels. Um, but it's been a really big shift, I'll say, just as a facilitator as well. Um, and so that becomes part of it for, for us. So we usually start with the equality week. The second week is the power and control. And then the third week is well, we'll do a lot of role plays, you know, like think, what would you have to believe to actually do this? And I just give one example. We had a, I observed a group that was doing our curriculum. By the way, we get asked to observe it a lot and, you know, lots of people do it in different ways. But one thing is we watch a facilitator say, so let's talk about how you request something from your partner instead of demand something. So if you want to request it, right, let's name what you would do because the women are saying you demand too much. Let's say request. And so um, they said, okay, so now we're gonna practice, practice requesting something. But the thing that they miss the most is that most of those men in the room don't believe that they have to request something. They actually have a belief that says, when I ask you something, you had better do it. And so you can teach them the skill, the words, the way, the how, but if they actually don't believe it, can't it's, do it. They can't do it. They literally cannot do it. And so it's a really big thing that we say. The difference is, is that when men believe things differently, like on the equality wheel, they're going to feel things differently and do things differently. Okay? So it's a, just kind of a big distinction for us is that when you believe something, right, it's a very different thing. Um, so, for example, if Scott, if Scott and I are partners and he believes that uh, he can demand me to do things, and we taught him a skill of how to use a calm voice and practice it in group and do it in a way with kind words. First of all, I'm not going to believe him. I'm going to tell you my lived experience is I will not believe him. And if I know he's being monitored by probation, I might kick him, hit him, scream at him, call him a whole bunch of names. Okay? Because I, I know he doesn't actually believe it, what he's, what he's saying. To well, and the other thing, too, is that Let's say he actually is changing, and he actually does believe it, right? In that circumstance, right? And everybody around him sees his change. Facilitators see it, his pastor sees it, his family sees it. Who's the last person on the planet who's going to believe him? The person who has the most to lose, and that's her. Yeah. And right? if we were partners, like, I may never, ever believe that, and I don't have to. I don't. I don't have to. And so that's why we said this can't be like framed in this relationship problem context. Because when you get beaten, raped by someone, you actually don't have to ever trust them again. Right. You actually don't. I mean, that's the liberating thing about this field, I think, for women, is that that's where we've gotten moved to in our work. So, so. The, uh, there was a guy who, uh, he and his partner, he ended up breaking her bones on two different occasions. So the violence was severe. But they ended up staying together. And he had been nonviolent for 10 years. And um, they were driving on the Gunflint Trail up in northern Minnesota and to a campground. And she said, do you remember when you beat me down the end of that road? And he said, the first thing in my head was, how dare you bring this up? Like, it's been 10 years and I have, right? And then he just, he said, before I opened my mouth, I realized back to the conversation we had in class, this is a consequence of what I've done. I may drive by that driveway and never remember what I did at the end of it but she'll never go by that driveway and not remember it. And if I want to stay with this woman, this is my consequence, not her problem, mm -hmm. right? That That's, I get to bring it up every single time. Those conversations to. have to be in class. If you don't have those conversations in class, then the guys think that, sh that she's the crazy one, right? Because I'm the one who's making all the changes. Yeah. This is what happens when you put too much focus on changing the offender and not link it the way that, um, um, we've organized it where victims have to have input to the process. You learn all kinds of homework. We don't give homework. We used to give tons of homework. Because the guys kept saying that when, or the guys, the women kept saying that when you give the homework, he either sits me down and makes me do it, stands over me, right? Or um, he complains to me, gets crabby, starts screaming at me because he's got to sit down, can't watch his game because he's got to get the homework done. Right now it's all my fault, quit sending homework home. We realized, we thought it was an educational tool. We realized it was creating a safety problem at home. 
Why did we realize it? Because we're talking to the women who were, who were involved with the guys that we're working with. They told us stop, right? So we did. Because we're not doing it for us, we're doing it for them. The number one reason a facilitator walks into a men's group in Duluth, under our model, is her safety. The second is for his change. But his change should never be a priority over her safety and anything that we do in that room. Which was the first Thank bullet you. there? Thank you, about most of them. Yeah, okay, so these are the principles. You can read those. These are some of the, um, the things that we've received over the years. You can, you can look at those too. Not everybody thinks that we are the, you know, the uh, pariah of the domestic violence movement. <laughs> I, I can tell you though, like the power and control wheel, just to give you an example though, it's now been translated into 20, or 33 different languages and 22 different cultural contexts. And um, I recently represented the um, U.S. at a United Nations event in Madrid, Spain in June. And what's fascinating me, to me about this work in this field is that you go to the, um, the international scene on violence against women, and what happens on the international scene, it never gets psychologized. It never yeah. is about skills. You will never, ever hear that discussion. Canada, United States, and England are the only ones only, struggling with that. Yes. And even Australia, which is, pretty, you know, they, they don't even do it. Australia doesn't even do it, or New Zealand. But we're the only three countries that have taken this like it's an individual problem with the individual man who has individual skills and deficits. We had some Kurds in Duluth, and there was a mullah um, um, from a religious leader from their community, and, and some women and other men. And I said, why do men beat women in your community? And he said, and she said, the woman said, well, because they can. Every institution is run by them and is backed by them. There's no accountability. And then the religious leader said, they misinterpret the Quran. They use it as a tool as opposed to a guide, a spiritual guide. Mm -hmm. It's the same stuff that the guys in Minnesota are doing yeah. in, in evangelical faith, right? They're not, it's not about the faith. It's about using it as a tool to control her. So there's just, it's never a question when you go over there, yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you to say the opposite then of how what you just said, because it's going to be helpful for talking points of both women and our community. So if it's not about individual skill deficits, yep. it's about Yep, and so the difference would be, would be about this, and it's about the beliefs that men have when engaging in relationships with women. So we're talking about intimate heterosexual relationships. That's our work. And so just to use Scott and I as an example, so, I mean, we literally had a guy in group, um, he, I, I swear he did this. He couldn't find the, we changed where the group was. He couldn't find it. So I happened to answer the phone. He's like, you know, where is group, blah, blah, blah. And I was trying to describe it. It was a really hard place to find. And he says, no wonder why women get beat. You're all so stupid. And he hung up. It's well, we gender. Have a program, you know? right? It's <laughs> right? It's and so gender. then he didn't realize that I, that I was the person who answered the phone, and I'm his group facilitator. Right? <laughs> so he laughed about that when he came in. But I mean, <laughs> yes, welcome. And it wasn't his first week. But I mean, in part, though, I mean, he. He believed, I mean, and this is the way he goes, I have to tell you, I see stupid women all over. I just see stupid women. That's what I see. How can you, how can, I don't know how other people can't see stupid women, right? So my point is that he, he, his belief, right, he has all this thinking about the position of men, the position of women in relationships, right? And so because he has that thinking, he's going to act on that a particular way. And when he sees it, it creates a feeling with him, in him, right? So that's the distinction, is that when you have a belief, okay, and you believe it's true, and it happens to you. Like another guy, we have uh, many men for us all say that, you know, women waste money. Women are terrible with money. Men are better with money, right? And so when they see their partners waste money, I mean, they say, it just makes me so angry and so mad, right? Because he has the belief, all women are terrible with money, right? So if he didn't have that belief, right, that I, that if we're, that I actually have the same intellectual capacity to manage money, it may do it differently, you know, blah, 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 but different isn't bad, all that sort of stuff, 
then he's not going to have the feelings of the anger, right, the upset, all that sort of stuff that comes with it. But I can just tell you um, over and over that when we've um, talked with uh, better women who've said that their partners get taught skills, I mean, it's the same thing with parenting stuff, you know, we've, we've now have an addendum to our curriculum um, about parenting. And so what we see, it so clearly in that one too, because what we say is you'll, we'll see parenting programs uh, teach a skill, like patience, right? Well, in order to have patience, you have to actually have a certain number of beliefs as it relates to children, right? If, if you want to teach patience. So like, what's a belief you'd have to have with children if you actually want to be patient? Somebody share a belief that you have about children and being a parent. Anybody have one? What's that? The, yeah, right, that you should listen to them, to your children, right? Now, do you know any, I don't know many men who batter who have that belief. They actually usually have the yeah. opposite, right? The kids My listen. children had better listen to me, right? And so imagine teaching patience to a man who believes I should only have to tell, tell my child once. I mean, it's literally like this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's beliefs about intimate partner relationships. And we see... Beliefs then turn into actions based on the field. Yes. And the inverse... It's connected, right? And the inverse is true, right? So when they change their thinking, they come to class and say, this is what I did. We never taught you that. But look at what you just did. We didn't right? teach him that Because you, that you don't think about yourself and your kids or her the, di the same way. You think about them differently. You actually sat down and listened to her validated her and we never taught you validation mm -hmm. right because it's that's the crux of this stuff yeah women are invisible with entitlement I mean I'm telling you this from a personal lived experience like you you're literally invisible what you have to say doesn't matter what you do does it does because you are your needs your thinking um, are really invisible I mean essentially then we become Sexual objects, essentially, right? We are, and um, I, I say, you know, we we're, we're for use in the bed, for for use with the chores, and for use with the children. And that when you are that entitled, you actually don't really care what they think. Um, so I'm just. This is maybe more discussion oriented. I don't mean to interrupt, but it's bringing a lot to mind for me that. Um, it kind of goes back to this idea earlier that I was mentioning about like the difference between like a very clinical world and the social justice way of addressing these issues. And I was having a conversation recently with a psychologist in our community where it really is this perception of when we talk about it in the way that you're talking about it, that you're missing this whole unseen world. How would you, like it's, they're really divergent the way that they like um, critique each other well, Those, so, like, at least from like the super professionalized mental health world, mm -hmm. yeah. and it, that's my experience locally. Yeah. And so um, it's nationally too. Okay. Yeah. And so I just I I I feel like that's going to be emerging part of the issue as far as like how the field presents itself. And part of that I I think comes out of programs that they've done with juvenile sexual offenders because it is very much like problems with the individual and I think they're doing that because of the age of that child and they're not wanting to like well but it, their field doesn't have a way of taking up a social problem yeah everything gets individuated to the person yeah and so it doesn't matter if it's juveniles or adults right you've got a problem you come to me and I, I help you with yes. that problem yes That's I don't exactly link the it. problem yeah. to the social issues that inform it as right? if we don't live in social context mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? I mean, but I just want to give an example, though. I want to say, though, we don't believe it's an either or, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, we believe that lots of men should be in therapy, but it's different work, right? right? right. So, lots of men have very traumatic childhoods, have experienced lots of trauma, right? I mean, we, this really came up when we added our fathering work, um, work with men as parents. Um, and so what we would say is the differences, and maybe Scott can share a story just to um, his own personal, but what we say to men is that that work is done in therapy work, but he can deal with the trauma of the experience of the childhood, okay? But he could still have all the same beliefs about his place and role in relationships with women. Which are learned. 
Right, which so, are learned, right? So, so get, it, Scott has an example I, for you know, I was sexually abused by two different men outside my family when I was a kid. I was raped by one, sexually abused for six years by another one, and then my dad was a batterer. So I watched my dad just basically run every moment of the house when he was in it. And I went to therapy when I was 29, deal with the trauma. My therapist was an angel, saved my life. Um, I got out. She said, it's time to go out and live your life. You know, figure out what you're going to do. And I meet a woman named Julie. We move in together. And I just try to tell her, teach her how to buy groceries because she didn't quite understand that there was a real, real good way to do that. <laughs> and I just haven't had the way, right? <laughs> and so I, what I had to do now is go through and figure out what did I learn I get to do as a man in relationship with a woman that really didn't get taken up as part of the trauma work that I did as a child. It's really a different thing. So both can be important for individual men. Some men don't have a lot of trauma in their history. They just have a lot of thinking that is problematic. Lisa. So I would say that in terms of New Mexico, one of the, our biggest challenges is the coordinated piece here. Yeah. We have a hodgepodge, and, and that I think is a kind way to put it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, patchwork, um, you know, of services or lack thereof. We have every individual, local, um, county or district doing things the way that they want it. A real lack of sort of systemic anything. Policies or uh, oversight or even really a will to, um, to, standardize anything, to change from things that are really not serving the vast majority of citizens in New Mexico, but mm -hmm. serve, you know, some people, I guess. Uh, so my question to you, and there may not be an answer here, is, um, you know, your model, I think, presupposes, in a good way, the participation, like Rachel was saying, um, and the involvement and the will to do this for the benefit of society. Right. If we don't have that, where do we even begin the process of changing the culture to want that, you yeah. know, or to even think about it as a, as a possibility? Well, here's the one thing I would tell you, though, which I would say that in terms of, I know it's the, the work of this task force to pick a curriculum, right? I mean, I actually am going to make a bold statement to you, which is don't pick one to do unless you have all the other. Because honestly, I can tell you this. Our founder said the, mo the most profound thing she ever said to me was this. If we end domestic violence in 20 years, and at that 20-year mark, and we look back and say, how did we do it? I guarantee you it will not be because of butts and chairs in a men's group. That will not be the thing that ended it. Okay, so when you put all your time and energy just in that, I mean, it, it's, I mean, even if you look at the substance abuse field, right? I mean, even their work is much more community-based now. And so, you know, a lot of people are familiar with that as well. But so, I mean, what we say, and, and I think to Scott's point, is that in Duluth, we started with the police. And the thing that we did that I think is most important is um, advocacy and outsiders is we went in just to learn. We didn't go in with notions saying you have to do it this way, and we, we always say don't say do it this way because dilute that, you know what I mean? Like you will find your way, but we always approach these things as a teacher, learner, learner, teacher. So for example, our advocates, our advocates have to do so many police ride-alongs, they have to do so much observation in court, they have to observe so much police work because we say you do not have a point of credibility to walk into a major institution for which you have never worked and then tell them how to do their work differently, right? I mean, that's not the way of systems change work. And so we say, we walk in humbly in a major institution to learn how their work is organized and see if they want to partner with us. And the thing we have to put aside, everyone, I'm not, I'm not directing this to you, but our egos, right? I mean, honestly, like we just have to get in a place for sometimes more, just that we're going to learn from people about their work. And, and when we start, most communities will start with police, but it has to be led by advocacy organizations. We really believe it's core to how we think about our intervention. And but men's the, groups is not the answer. One of the struggles, too, is, is that, you know, as advocates, we kind of say, there's, the world's two, two groups, those who get it, those don't, <laughs> you know? And when we go in, 
I can guarantee you police won't get it. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they don't have to. What they have to do is walk in to a house with a domestic and ask these questions and document it this way and separate the parties. They have to do that, okay? And they have to document it. And we can review that. They could go home and think sexist thoughts about women, right? We're not trying to change them into feminists. We're trying to get them to do a particular job that helps the rest of us do ours, yeah. right? That's... Yeah. They have to yeah. see it in their own best interest. Yeah. They can't see it in yours. That would be hard, right? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I asked Dan, who's our um, uh, counselor and director of our counseling services, to get me some information. And over the last three months in our county alone, there were uh, 37 people referred to us for uh, court-ordered services. Of those 37, 22 were men and 15 were women. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, we have a meeting with the chief of police. Now, not all those people came from the city, sure. but I'm sure a significant amount of them did. What? do I say without screaming? Yeah, oh, I know. Like the, what it's you? really, it's, it's hard. <laughs> and yeah. I've been at this job now since 1999. And I gotta tell you, it makes me feel like crap. Yeah, I know. Because what am I doing? What am I doing? Do you, um, do, how good are your police reports? Yeah, pardon me? How, how good, good are the are police reports? Just in terms of this. Regardless of who's they? getting arrested, how well are they documenting the violence? What happened? That kind of stuff. They're, they're pretty poor. A lot okay. of them have typos, uh, wrong uh, ethnicity. Um, it's, but I'm, I don't want to say so terrible. Sure. But I mean, uh, <laughs> well, well, you kind of did. Public. Okay. One he one he said to me, uh, one one that I took down that was in an assessment that he did said. Um, uh, this was a woman, and he said what happened, and, and she said that the police officer came in and said, who hit who first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We've been here yeah, since right. before night. So, so when you look at the problem, what do you, what, is, so you're seeing the problem that women are getting arrested at too high of a rate. Is that, is that the problem that you're seeing? Is that women are getting arrested at too high of a rate compared to men? Well, that was Because one of the things. Many things out of that. Because when, you know, he get the opportunity to do an assessment out of that and decide, uh, you know, whether we think that person is a, a, a victim or an offender and overwhelmingly. Um, they're victims. They're victims. Yeah, they're victims. We call them victim defendants. Yes. So, go, go, well, go and not even, not even that because it's not all reported. Everything that happened right. in that, in that event is not even the event is all recorded. So here's the, here's the, here's the, here's a Duluth model organizing approach to this, right? Yeah. The gap is, not the problem, the gap is, is that women are getting arrested at too high a rate for what actually women's violence versus men's violence is, is, happens at, right? Men commit way more domestic violence than women do, right? So there's a problem with, the, with that rate, that's a gap. So then what's the solution? Well, we don't know what the solution is first. First, the first thing yeah. we're going to do is we're going to sit down with a bunch of women who got arrested and ask them about their lives. Yep. About and we're going to document those focus groups. And, we're gonna, and, and whether you record them, we record them and have them transcribed. And then we take the names out. And then, that, and then that becomes, then you'll have a whole lot of information about what the impact of arresting a woman who's been battered for domestic violence has on her, right? That the officers are not going to have available to them because they're incident driven, right? solve the problem right now, go home, prosecutors deal with it later. They don't have any more connection. So now they get, to, they get a sense of the impact of what they're doing when they make these arrests. The next thing is, is to, if you had, a, you know, I don't know the quality of your police reports, but to sit down with them after you have those focus groups done and read the reports like we did in Duluth and say, was justice served? Given what's happened here and the, the protect and serve, 
vulnerable citizens of our community, and better women are vulnerable, was justice served. And the officers at the table with the advocates in Duluth said, no, no, this is not what we intended to do. We had no idea, right? So the, 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 the skill here for an organizer is not to jump to the conclusion too fast or to the meeting with the chief about what to do too fast. It's to say, we'd like to engage the police department in a process of, of figuring out what to do with women arrested and find out more about them. We're gonna do some focus groups. We also wanna work with your officers to, to engage them in solving, you know, creating a rest policy that works given the reality we find. And we don't know the answers yet, because you don't until you talk to the women. And they'll help you design, mm -hmm. given your community and what's going on in it, what the response needs to be, right? So that's the conversation I would have. Not that, damn, right? <laughs> You're doing something that's a huge problem. You don't even know what the problem is yet. It could be just basic evidence collection questions that they're not asking that would flush out more of the reality to help them understand what's mm -hmm. going on and distinguish who the batterer is, who the victim is. We can't do that right now given your reports. Or it could be that all the women are pleading guilty at arraignment, so that's why they're all getting sent to you, right? I mean, it can just be so many things. You know, like in Duluth, um, I'll never forget, so when our founder, Ellen, was still alive, it was about two years um, before she died, and a phone call came into Duluth, and um, I happened to take it, and this, somebody called, you know, very kind of square, and said, so we're going to do groups with women who are arrested, and so we're using your men's curriculum, so what do I do with that session on male entitlement, <laughs> male privilege? <laughs> I think this Ellen actually is here. Let me have you talk to her because I knew she would just be so upset about it. And so anyway, she talked it through as Ellen did. She hung up. And so I had been bugging her, Laura and I, for years to do something, right? Because we knew people were doing this, right? Doing the same work with women who were arrested or taking the men's work and just reapplying it. And so we got her motivated to do this. But I will tell you, it was another, such a clear example to me. We actually said, like, you cannot do our work with women who are arrested unless you have a community response that creates justice. Because it is not justice to prosecute her the same way and give her the same sentence. So that's why we created um, a prosecution policy for um, battered persons. It's not gendered, battered persons. It's here that um, no um, battered man has um, even qualified yet. And not because um, we've disqualified, it's because they haven't asked, because they knew based on the criteria they wouldn't um, probably qualify, but for the most part, so better women as defendants then, we know when our focus group, the biggest thing we learned for our focus group, the problems with getting jobs, most of them were in helping professions. So in our state, you can no longer be a teacher, you can no longer be a paraprofessional in the school, you can no longer work in the nursing home where majority of them worked, right? You can't be a PCA, you can't do any helping field job, you know, anymore. If you, in Minnesota, it's state by state, if you have a conviction. So the implications were so big, and the prosecutor's like, well, that's not justice, right? So we wrote this policy then that says that if you're a battered defendant um, and you meet certain criteria, that you'll get a deferred prosecution, essentially. The case will be dismissed if you come to our women's group. And so we designed it based on that, based on those experiences. Um, but I agree with Scott, you gotta hold, uh, the thing I'll say about advocacy, you have to hold judgment and keep the judgment you know, for, I say from dripping off of us, right? Because I've worked as long as you, I started in 99 as well, and I can tell you, I can't do this work in, in Duluth, because, you know, in Duluth or northern Minnesota, another county I work in, because I get way too judgmental. And so I have to, if, if I've been doing a lot of advocacy with better women, I mean, I want to say, like, I just think that advocates are the least respected, most underpaid people in this work. And there are a lot of people, you know, disrespected and underpaid, but it's really, really, really hard work to sit with women day after day after day and to be present for that level of violence and injustice in their lives. So then to expect to go from that room, I say we have a room and we meet with women, and then to a meeting with the police chief, I, I know I can't do it, so I don't even try. And right? advocates look at me try. and say, how do you sit in a room with the criminal justice folks asking why women keep finding men to beat them? You know, and, you know, but we all have our abilities. I would have a hard time doing that job. I can do this job because I don't have the expectation that they have the answers, right? And we'll work and we'll figure it out together. Is there 
a list of the policies that you would consider the like, so mm -hmm. there's just yeah. Every policy for every criminal justice agency is on our website. It's there. Yeah, it's okay. under the blueprint for safety. <coughs> the loose blueprint for safety. So I apologize if I'm not up to speed on everything the Duluth model does or what your organization does, but one of the things that you mentioned that sticks out to me in Bernalillo County, which we're in, is, is, is really doing this, is some type of risk assessment. So when you talk about law enforcement at the scene um, doing a risk assessment, is there a form or how does that get documented and then what type of assignment of that risk do you give out and how does that work with all your other agencies that look at that? Okay, so there's a big trend now is risk, right? Everyone yeah. has to assess risk. And so then you go in and say, so what do you do with it? These are the questions right here. Right. Well, we, we, we uh, put it in our police report. I said, well, then what's the, who uses it? Well, the prosecutor should. Well, okay. <laughs> so if, before you implement something, you gotta implement what it's gonna mean for the whole system, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so when the police ask these questions, right, that gives us the bulk of our risk information that we use to do the ODERA, um, which is an actuarial risk tool. And, it, and the reason we use the ODERA is because the risk information that goes to the court uses only public data. We don't wanna use any private. So Jackie Campbell's is the best out there, but it's really an interview with the victim and we can't routinely give that to the criminal justice system because the defense will get it. So, um, so there's an ODERA done and then any risk factor like alcohol use, we take Andy Klein's piece that he did for the National Institutes of Justice um, and I can get the stuff emailed to somebody, to, to Pam and you can send it out, but um, we took all of our risk factors from there and, and basically two, three sentences about what makes it a risk factor, alcohol, the citations that go underneath it because that's what the judges wanted. And that goes on a bail memo because our prosecutors don't go to arraignment court, okay? So people come to Lou and say, damn, your prosecutors aren't in arraignment court. You know, how do you get anything? Well, that's not gonna change. So then how do we process, collect, analyze and distribute risk information so that everybody has that. And basically what we've done is created a file that follows that guy that, to every point that he intervenes with in the system. So every practitioner gets the same information. And an advocate puts it together. That's a member of the divert team. The so domestic she has violence access enhanced to the, response team. She has access to things that I as her supervisor don't. Mm -hmm. um, she goes into the database, she pulls all this stuff in the morning. Um, we have an MOU with the police department. We can print other police department's reports on our, on that, the Duluth PD's terminals, which is a rule you have to get around. Um, so yeah, I mean, the design isn't do the risk assessment. The design, if we're gonna do it, how are we gonna use it, right? That's the question to answer. And then we figure out who does it. Um, so if they're doing it, then the question is who's using it and how? And is it being used in the way it's intended? Because we got law, we got you know we got law enforcement agencies that I've talked to where they're combining risk tools that are actuarial. Well, you you can't then say you, you're getting this particular answer because you've just combined two tools that don't. And relate. then and then the more important thing for me is then if you're going to do that, then right then don't still have them this one size fit all sentence. I mean, I look at the sentencing for a hundred domestic violence offenders; they're almost all the same often when you go in a community but they're doing risk. Well, they're clearly not using it, right? I mean, they're just clearly not because they're not all at the same risk level, so. Right. And the only difference with our county is we're using it for bail amounts. So, That's great. Which, yeah. which is great, although, um, you know, the risk assessment tools that we're using is public information. So they're trying to figure out between uh, interview process while the person is incarcerated. Mm -hmm whether there's resources to have somebody sit there and analyze and ask questions so they could figure that out or just using public data. But part of that is uh, we're trying to move because of a new case law that came in New Mexico is that it's a presumption that everybody should be released with very little bail being posted. Um, 
which can, in effect, not take into consideration other things, especially with DV cases, because they're not going to have a huge number of domestic violence arrests, yeah. right? Even if it's a misdemeanor case. So on paper, they may not appear to be very dangerous, and there's no other information, like you talked about alcoholism or, or uh, you know, a anything else that was on your list threats, that's not being considered. So, yeah. so that's, I think, what our, com what our state is, is looking at and focusing on. And so my question is, how do we incorporate some other type of propensity for reoffending, especially with violence and intimate partner relationships, into these other models that are very factual, report-oriented? Yeah, so when you work in corrections, for example, corrections has this propensity to create templates mm -hmm. so that every person is the same. So when I went into my inquiry part of working with the Department of Corrections and asking questions, I said, so give me the example of a sex offender. This guy rapes his wife. This guy abuse, sexually abuses children. This guy raped a woman who he didn't know. How is, how is, well, they all go through the same sex offender treatment program, but it's all very different. How is the conversation anywhere near the same, right? But it's about getting people through mm -hmm. a hole um, on the way out so that they can say they've done it. And it may work for a certain population that they're working with, but if you, if you rated the individual populations, the person who rapes his wife, the person who rapes children, they may be quite different under recidivism. But in aggregate, it looks like it's working. So what we have to have that conversation about how this crime poses a particular ongoing risk to the victim that general assaults don't. Mm -hmm. And we have to account for it, otherwise we're not accounting for the community that we're living in, right? She's here, she's in danger, and we're really kind of ignoring it by not taking it up in a different way than we would somebody who got beat up at a bar. Mm -hmm. They're not the same. That's why in the same way, I just wanna say like, you know, part of about, I know part of what you're asking was about recidivism rates. You're not comparing apples and apples. You know, our, our definition of recidiv recidivism is very broad. It's a call to the house, right? It's order for protection. I mean, if, if, if you do advocacy, you know that, I mean, half the better women that come to our program never talk to the police and never intend to, right? But they're gonna get sent to men's group, right? Because they can get sent in Minnesota order for protection. And then, you know, as part of that, it, they'd be considered recidivism if she renews the order, right? And she files for a modification of some sort to make it tighter. So all those things get counted. So it's a very different thing to look at just criminal intervention. I mean, think about if you have the responses of police that some of you are kind of saying, right? I'm imagining the battered women know that, right? So their propensity to actually think of them as a helping agency is probably a bit lower. Right? So then all, you have to consider all of that when you're thinking about recidivism and what it means. Because for battered women's real lives, that's what it means. Re recidivism is much broader than just a rearrest.